Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston, and this is The National. Universal health care in action. Bernie Sanders visits Canada for an up-close look. How does it happen that here in Canada, you provide health care to every man, woman, and child, and you do it at 50% of the cost? A spate of overdose deaths draws Canada's opioid crisis into sharp focus. It's just despair. Like, everyone's just hurting. Our panel of frontline experts weighs in. In less than 24 hours, we could see criminal charges in the investigation into possible Russian collusion in the U.S. election. The president's reaction today and... The scenery is peaceful, the politics are not. Can Turkey resist the tide of religious conservatism? Canadians, what differentiates this country from the U.S. and inevitably, the conversation turns to health care. This weekend, former U.S. presidential candidate Bernie Sanders was in Canada touring hospitals, asking questions, and today talking about our system to a packed house. Lorenda Redekop was there. <laughs> Bernie Sanders is still a hot ticket on campus, popular with this crowd at the University of Toronto, just as he was with U.S. students during his presidential run. Real change always happens from the bottom on up. He calls this visit a fact-finding mission to learn more about Canada's health system. He toured three different hospitals, meeting patients fully covered by Medicare. So I came in on Tuesday. And by then we determined that I also needed a double bypass. Including one recovering from heart surgery. The issue that has got to be studied is how does it happen that here in Canada they provide quality health care to all people. And I don't think there is any debate that the quality of care here is as good or better than in the United States. And they do it for half the cost. Dr. Danielle Martin played tour guide for the senator and his team. She's a founder of Canadian Doctors for Medicare and a fierce proponent of public health care. Her back and forth with a U.S. senator in 2014 went viral. How many Canadian patients on a waiting list die each year? Do you know? I, I don't, sir, but I know that there are 45,000 in America who die waiting because they don't have insurance at all. Martin acknowledges the Canadian system has its flaws. Bernie Sanders wants to address some of them in his plan for health care in the U.S. It includes free prescriptions, dental and eye care. Sanders' ideas resonate with this audience. Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne introduced him. Her government is bringing in prescription drug coverage for everyone under 25. The senator encourages us to think bold. He pushes us to think uh, about bold steps that we can take to build the kind of world that we want to live in. New federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was also there. Like Sanders, he'll also be pushing for prescription drugs to be fully funded by the government. But across the border, the Canadian system is sometimes mocked. Well, we don't want the socialized health care they have in Canada. We want American solutions. And if you ever notice the Canadians, when they need a big operation, when something happens, they come into the United States in many cases because their, their system is so slow. It's it's catastrophic in certain ways. President Trump got elected on a platform promising to get rid of what little Medicare there is in the U.S. And that's still the goal for his administration. So for all of Bernie Sanders' popularity here in Toronto this weekend, his dream of fully funded health care still seems unlikely in today's political reality. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. This wasn't Sanders' first health care-related trip to Canada. Years ago in the Senate, he recalled putting together the first bus trip, taking his constituents over the Canadian border to buy lower-cost prescription drugs. We went from St. Albans, Vermont, to Montreal, Canada. And I will never forget the look on the faces of those women who were struggling for their lives when they bought breast cancer medicine at 10 percent of the cost that they were paying in the state of Vermont. Since then, the cost of many prescription drugs in Canada has risen dramatically to some of the highest prices in the world. 
Police in Abbotsford, B.C. have a grim warning about opioids. Don't use alone and carry a naloxone kit. The alert comes after a spate of fatal drug overdoses. Five people died within just nine hours on Friday. Briar Stewart reports. Yeah, I used one of these the other night on a friend of mine. This man is talking about a syringe full of naloxone, the opioid antidote. He doesn't want to be on camera, but told us that on Friday in Abbotsford, his friend overdosed after taking drugs. I have a hard time breathing. He was gurgling. His legs were kicking, and I had to basically lay on him to stick it in his leg. That man was saved, but another one of his friends died the very same day, also because of an overdose. They found him gone. Alone, you know. On Friday, during a nine hour period, five people in this city died of overdoses. Most of them were inside, and all of them died alone. Toxicology tests aren't yet done, but police believe it was the result of opioids. Police say the victims were between the ages of 40 and 67. Three were men, two were women. People have in their minds, for whatever reason, um, is that uh, all of these overdose deaths are all happening in back alleys, that they're predominantly young people who are partying, etc., or entrenched drug users. The vast majority, based on provincial statistics, of overdose deaths are taking place indoors. Well, I struggled with uh, addiction. From a very young age, uh, age 12, you know, I was introduced to crack cocaine. And Jolene Gray Eyes is a recovering addict who is now a frontline worker in the city. She's already lost a lot of friends to opioids like fentanyl and carfentanyl. I'm not sure who, who passed on in Abbotsford. You know, I'm still waiting on, on the who. And, you know, it's never a good feeling waiting to hear. Who, who's passed on next? <laughs> this is our community outreach center. Ward Draper uh, does outreach work out of this van. Empty this thing daily. He and his team oh. pass out clean yeah, needles like and containers to dispose of the used ones. So, he yeah. says those who work in harm reduction are overwhelmed. So far this year in BC, more than 1,000 people have died because of illicit drug overdoses. It's just despair. Like everyone's just hurting mentally, physically, all the time, just in pain. And it's um, no showing no sign of slowing. And he says it won't unless there's better access to detox programs and treatment beds. Without that, he believes, the deaths will only continue. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Abbotsford, B.C. Winnipeg police have also issued a warning about fentanyl ahead of Halloween. These are fentanyl blotters, a piece of paper about the size of a stamp printed with the image of a witch. Police have already seized six of them and believe more are out there. Police advise if you see one, don't touch it. Call 911 right away. We'll have more on Canada's opioid crisis coming up on tonight's Sunday panel. That's in about 15 minutes. A big security breach at London's Heathrow Airport. A British newspaper says a man found a USB memory stick containing sensitive security information lying on the street. There were details about the security measures used to protect the Queen when she travels, notes on the location of CCTV cameras and directions on how to access restricted areas. Officials from Heathrow are investigating. Months of speculation and anxious anticipation have Washington bracing itself because tomorrow charges are widely expected in the investigation into whether Donald Trump's campaign had ties with Russia. But it's not clear who or how many people will be charged, even what the charges could be. Lindsay Duncombe reports. It's not hard to imagine that President Donald Trump is fuming this weekend, not just because cameras caught him on the golf course, something the White House tries hard to avoid, but because Robert Mueller's investigation into the 2016 election is about to lay a criminal charge or charges. That's going to be the, uh, the beginning, the official beginning of uh, court proceedings in this matter. And obviously, once uh, court proceedings uh, begin, uh, they are public. The matter is Russian involvement in the 2016 election, any possible collusion with the Trump campaign, and any potential obstruction of justice. But the thing to remember about Mueller's investigation is how broad it is. The Justice Department instructed Mueller to follow any matters that arose or may arise in the course of the investigation. 
that's going to be really important whether or not uh, this indictment involves 15-year-old business transactions or 15-day-old conversations uh, with, with Russia. Two people are the subject of much speculation tonight, former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort and former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Both have foreign business ties, but charges could be laid against someone further removed from the president, a person who could be flipped and used as a witness. Typically you want to be pursuing people and pressuring people who have information of an incriminating nature above you in the food chain. Trump has wriggled against the investigation for months. Today was no exception. They ought to get to the end of it because I think the American public is sick of it. Trump tweeted it was a witch hunt and evil politics. Trump and his supporters have been trying to switch the collusion conversation, saying Hillary Clinton's campaign was the one too close to the Kremlin, citing an Obama-era deal which saw American uranium interests sold to Russia while Clinton was Secretary of State, and reports this week Clinton's campaign helped pay for the spy-written dossier that implied the Russians had Trump in their pocket. And here's the challenge for Mueller. Whatever he concludes, whomever he charges, many Americans won't buy it. They'll believe this is all politically motivated because that's what the president is telling them. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Today was another volatile day in the troubled Spanish region of Catalonia. Enormous crowds again packed the streets of Barcelona, not to celebrate Friday's declaration of independence, but to defy it, marching to preserve a united Spain. The CBC's Margaret Evans was there. An answer to the Catalan Parliament's declaration of independence, delivered with strength on the streets of Barcelona today. Pro-unionists raising the Spanish flag, and with it, they hope, the national government in Madrid, as it seeks to regain control of Catalonia. We are Catalan, we live here, but we, we feel Spanish, so we don't want independence. It is the second big pro-unity march here in Barcelona, the Catalan capital, since the 1st of October. People are angry, and it's a sign that the stakes are getting higher. People on the streets here are actually calling for the Catalan president, or ex-president, Carles Puigdemont, to be jailed. Irene Bruyeres is an architect. I'm not going to follow a president that doesn't follow the law. It's very dangerous for our country. The pro-independence camp says he had no choice, given Spain's refusal to allow a referendum. And the answer uh, was been uh, uh, always no, no, no, no. Puigdemont's lawyer says he's expecting Spanish prosecutors to charge his client with rebellion as early as tomorrow, a move designed, he says, to criminalize a political conflict. Uh, there is a new republic, a new nut, uh, uh, who wants to, to become uh, a state, uh, but uh, he has uh, not the force. Uh, and there is an old state who has uh, all the forces. And demonstrations like today's, answered by rival separatist rallies, look set to continue, raising fears about the impact on an economy only just recovering. And these are our jobs. This is our wealth. This is an irresponsibility behavior of, of those politicians. And believe it or not, I think we will pay for that for, for years and years. I think companies need stability. And that's not in evidence here. Outside the seat of the Catalan government, pro-unity demonstrators angry at the gates and at the regional Catalan police, too. The question everyone is asking is whether that dismissed government will still turn up for work tomorrow. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Barcelona. There is fear of violence in Iraqi Kurdistan after Kurdish regional president Masoud Barzani announced his resignation. <laughs> Demonstrators stormed the Iraqi Kurdish parliament building, angry over the failed independence referendum. Earlier today, Barzani denounced the lack of support for Kurdish independence from Baghdad and criticized the U.S. for not supporting Kurds after helping in the fight against ISIS. 
Two of Somalia's top security officials have been fired after yesterday's attack that killed dozens of people in Mogadishu. Authorities also say the attackers used IDs from the National Intelligence Service as part of their plan. The gunman allegedly used stolen security IDs to gain access to the hotel after a truck bomb destroyed the front entrance. Then they went on a shooting rampage, holding off security forces for more than 12 hours. Three attackers were killed, two were captured. The militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility. The UN's food agency warns over three million people could starve in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Fighting between government troops and rebel militias intensified over a year ago, leaving 1.5 million people homeless. President Joseph Kabila continues to resist pressure to leave office, even though his second term expired almost 10 months ago. Coming up. A clash of values in Turkey. <laughs> what this wave of religious conservatism means for the country and its allies. Stephen Harper has ruffled some political feathers in a leaked memo. The former prime minister slammed the Trudeau government's handling of NAFTA negotiations. But by weighing into the issue, Harper could be creating problems for the current Conservative Party leader. David Cochran has more. Stephen Harper may not have wanted his memo to go public, but now that it has, he becomes one of the only prominent Canadian Conservatives who is aggressively criticizing the Trudeau government and their approach to NAFTA. In fact, prominent Conservatives like former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, former Interim Leader Rana Ambrose, and former Cabinet Minister James Moore, they're all advising the Trudeau government and supporting its strategy. So the Liberals have been quick to lash out at Harper for this. Christian Freeland tweeting that capitulation is not a negotiating strategy, saying that's essentially what Harper wants them to do. Now this could put Conservative leader Andrew Scheer in a tough spot, forcing him to either break ranks on the United Front Canadian political parties are taking in these NAFTA talks, or to disavow the position taken by Harper. For his part, Scheer's office is saying tonight that he will always put Canada's interests at the forefront, but won't don't hesitate to criticize the government if it is taking the wrong approach. Privately, conservatives say making an issue out of the Harper memo is an attempt by the Liberals to distract from the ongoing controversy over Finance Minister Bill Morneau's personal finances. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Jason Kenney, the new leader of Alberta's United Conservative Party, wants to run in a by-election as soon as possible. Having uh, been elected leader yesterday, uh, there is a constitutional responsibility for the opposition to be prepared to be an alternative government, and the leader needs to be there. And so, MLA uh, Dave Rodney is stepping aside to let Kenny run. Coming up after the break, a deeper look into Canada's opioid crisis, our Sunday panel on the front lines of a desperate fight. CBC Music presents the Canadian Music Class Challenge. Teachers, go to cbcmusic.ca slash music class and upload your students playing a selected song to enter. As we reported earlier, a spate of fatal overdoses in Abbotsford, B.C. has become the latest devastating reminder of Canada's growing opioid crisis, at least 3,000 Canadians are expected to die of overdoses this year. Here now, three people on the front lines of the epidemic. Keir McDonald is the Deputy Executive Director for Lookout Society. It's an organization that provides housing and outreach services for the homeless. Wendy Muckle is Executive Director of Ottawa Inner City Health. And Judy Darcy is BC's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Minister, I'm going to start with you. Uh, more overdoses this weekend, you're in the middle of a crisis. What can you do now to save those who are already addicted? 
Well, this is devastating news from Abbotsford, uh, and we have been seeing four people a day dying in British Columbia on average. Those are all people who have loved ones, families and friends who are devastated by these losses. We can't allow it to become the new normal. That's why our government, it's one of the reasons our government created a ministry for mental health and addictions, the first one in Canada, and it's why in our first budget we are escalating the response so that we have more harm reduction out there, more safe consumption sites, more access to um, naloxone to, in order to save lives, uh, access to other prescription medications. I, I just approved a new guideline in that regard just a couple of weeks ago. But it's also very important that we have treatment options available for people because when we save someone's life in the overdose crisis, if they go back to living on the streets, which is often the case now, we're not giving them a pathway to hope. So we're also moving as quickly as we can to ensure that there are more opportunities for treatment, that we're doing, taking action on homelessness, uh, because the majority of people who are homeless are also people living with mental health and addiction. So we're taking, really taking an all-of-government approach, because we need to deal with the social factors uh, that are one of the important contributing factors to this perfect storm that we, has been created now. It is, it is a perfect storm, as you've described, and you're right in the middle of the crisis. What aren't you doing? Well, we are pouring it on. We are doing everything we possibly can. We've just invested $322 million over the next three years. We're escalating our response. We are ensuring that we're going to have a coordinated structure for the entire province so that we are hearing where all the hotspots are so that we can direct resources uh, and supports exactly where they're needed. But also just recently, as I mentioned, we are expanding access to prescription drugs like prescription hydromorphone, which is okay. another tool in our arsenal to ensure that people are not using um, poisoned toxic drugs, which is what's killing people right now. I want to bring in our other guests here. Keir McDonald, you've heard the minister. I know your focus is and worry is housing in part for people who are addicted. What do you see on the front lines that's needed and what's working? Yeah, look, housing has been a, a big factor in the, the increase and in spike in homelessness out here in BC, some 30% increase in the before the last count. You know, at Lookout Housing and Health Society, we actually also operate two of the new uh, supervised consumption sites in this province. So we had one open in June and another in July. So we've really been seeing everything from so our outreach through to our shelters and housing through to now uh, the use of those two new facilities. Um, okay, Keir, just for our audience, supervised consumption site, what are you talking about? Yeah, so many people may know uh, Insight, who's been around for something like 14 years now. Um, supervised consumption is a, is a new iteration of that. It's effectively a, an expanded use, um, expanded forms of use. So rather than just being able to come in and, and inject a drug, you're able to come into Safe Point and the Power Street Getaway now and also orally and nasally use those drugs. Wendy Muckle, Under the supervision. one of the things I've wondered about is for some Canadians, many perhaps, this crisis seems to have come out of nowhere, all of a sudden exploding. Is there a gap between how, how much we know about the crisis and whether we consider it a national health emergency? I think uh, it's interesting w that you comment on that because I was actually in Vancouver uh, back in February and saw what was going on and when I came back to Ottawa to try to raise the alarm really uh, it, nobody was all that interested and it really has taken a long time for people to really appreciate the enormity of the problem we have here and the complexity of the problem we have here and I think that uh, you know as a as a country we need to you know we need to learn from our colleagues and prepare ourselves for things which frankly are inevitable. So I'm very appreciative of all the, the help and support we've gotten from our colleagues in Vancouver, but also a bit frustrated that we're a bit slow to the party. So you're in your jurisdiction in Ottawa, you're doing some innovative things. What are you doing and do you think it's worth expanding? Uh, so uh, one of the things that we're doing, which the minister announced, um, we're, we are offering prescribed hydromorphone to people, and uh, we're hoping to very quickly expand that program. I do think that, that it is something that probably needs to be expanded right across the province. Uh, but you know, we, we need more things and we need more innovation and uh, it, it, we, we need that, that platform to be able to learn from each other and to have new and different ideas. This is, this is a health crisis which is unprecedented. We've never seen the complexity that we're dealing with 
uh, in any other disease process that I can remember. You know, people call this our call this the AIDS crisis, and AIDS was much much simpler than this is. Much much easier to manage. Uh, we need innovation. Kier McDonald, uh, do you think that we understand the addict, and do you think that we're tackling well enough, preventing people from becoming dependent? I think we're facing, we're fighting what we can see right now, and so there's been harm reduction responses across the board with enhanced supply of naloxone and supervised consumption sites and overdose prevention sites, but sometimes I worry that we don't fully yet understand this issue and exactly who these people are that are dying alone in their homes, which is the overwhelming majority of the population that are, that are dying from these fatal overdoses. So, I mean, I'd love to know a little bit more about the histories, and we've talked about a potential coroner's inquest over here to fully understand the stories and what is leading people to use alone. And, and, and the stigma that continues to exist and social isolation that despite all of these resources that are now flowing, it's just not having a dent in reducing the numbers. Minister, if I understand correctly, you are in favour of legalising some opioids and with people already worried about legalising marijuana in this country, why do you think that's an answer? Well, I think we need to learn from other jurisdictions. I mean, the issue of criminalization, legalization is a federal matter. We're, we're doing everything we can within the current federal framework. But I think the fundamental issue is that we need to start treating people who are living with addictions with the same dignity and respect and quality of care as people who are dealing with any other kind of physical illness. What's your and worry that really there? Is that we about that really, Well, there is still a huge stigma that is attached to it. That's a large reason why people use alone. I I think that, and, and people are dying when they use alone. I think it's critically important that we also understand how it is that, you know, how it, what it is that leads to addiction. And we know all of the clinical experts will say that trauma is a huge factor. Sometimes that's physical trauma, people living with a lot of pain um, and, uh, and becoming addicted to opioids initially. For many people, it's also psychological and emotional and social trauma. So in, in British Columbia's case, indigenous people are dying at a rate three times higher than the population at large. Yeah, that's astounding. Well, all the statistics around this crisis, frankly, are astounding. And, and I am wondering, Wendy, if uh, this idea of stigmatizing addicts is, a, how much of a barrier is it to tackling this? This is the thing, really, which uh, is which prevents our success. Uh, when when the opioid crisis first hit Ottawa in the at the end of February, and we started regular meetings with the drug using community, what was really clear right off the bat was that this us and them attitude, this inability for us to understand their world and their perspective and to respect it was killing people and that we needed to to really approach them it approach the community in a different way and really to build on the strengths of that community that is really the only way out of this we we don't understand the illicit drug market we don't understand um, how, why things work the way that we do the only way we can make, come up with good solutions is by listening to the people who are experts Kier McDonald what are you seeing in terms of people suffering from this. It's not just, you know, chronic drug addicts. It seems people are being becoming dependent quickly and fatally in a large cross-section of the population. Yeah, as, as the minister referred to, I mean, we're, the more we're understanding this issue and the, and the people that are suffering from this, um, it's revealing uh, underlying trauma and pain. Many people have suffered as a child or a youth, or whether you know whether that was injury, illness. Um, people are, are getting onto you know prescription drugs, prescription medications, and so now that we're tackling the use of opioids in prescriptions, um, as those were weaned off, people was continuing to self-medicate and unfortunately dealing with much more harmful drugs like fentanyl. These these days. So many of the stories we're hearing is it started with, you know, these weren't people that were oh, hardcore drug users, these were people that started with um, medication to address, to address trauma or pain. Mm. Minister Darcy, we just have a minute left. You know as well as I do, the uh, US declared this a national health emergency this week, elevating it in the public consciousness and, and in strategy. Is there something that we need to do? Would that help in this country? 
Well, we have certainly called on the federal government repeatedly, and I was at my first federal provincial territorial me meeting of ministers of health just last week in Edmonton, and we're certainly calling on the federal government to remove any of the barriers that are in place to us getting life-saving treatment into people's hands. And, and they, are, they are collaborating with us, but we think that we need to go further than that. We need to have, be able to put in place harm reduction sites more quickly, access to methadone, access to drug checking services. And we also think it's critically important that we build a national anti-stigma campaign, mm -hmm. federal government and provincial governments cooperating together in order to get the message out to Canadians that this is a health issue we need to stop treating, we need to stop stig stigmatizing people. You know, when you break your leg, you know what kind of treatment and care you're going to get when you go to an emergency room, and you know what the follow-up is going to be, but if you go to an emergency room, or if, if you're experienced, you live through an overdose crisis and you survive, you don't get s sympathy, you get stigma. So it's critical that we start seeing this as a health issue and really give people living with addictions the kind of support and care and dignity that they deserve. All right. Thank you, all three of you. I know we're going to continue this conversation. It's desperate. Thanks very much. Thank you. When we come back, once fiercely secular, Turkey is changing. Next, a look inside the wave of religious conservatism that's worrying many Turks. I hear lots of times from people that how do you produce wine in Turkey? They can't understand the tastings are forbidden. Let's hear for Jerry Duncan. On the next Mr. D. $200. $200. Do I hear? No, you don't. $500. Tuesday at 9.30 on CBC. I would have gone 750. <laughs> For centuries, Turkey has been a crossroads of civilizations, straddling East and West, modern life and Islamic tradition. Its complex history with Europe, marked by competition and war and ultimately peaceful coexistence. But after decades of democracy, Turkey's secular political system is starting to fray. And as Neil Coxell reports, that has many Turks concerned about where their country is headed. At this table, in this town, tradition shifts into many shapes, flowing from its wines and offered in its houses of worship. This is a region with ancient rituals ripe for resurrection, where religious and secular can coexist. I hear lots of times from people that, how do you produce wine in Turkey? Is it legal in Turkey? Does a Muslim produce wine in Turkey? They don't know our culture, and uh, they don't know that we are a secular country. We are a part of Europe. They think that it's a Middle East country that strict rules in it. Burak Özkan's vineyard sits near Turkey's Mediterranean coast, surrounded by the Taurus Mountains, in the town called Elmalı, once home to ancient Anatolian cultures. The soil, the conditions, the climate are all perfect for growing grapes. But winemaking was essentially abandoned during the hundreds of years under Ottoman rule starting in the 13th century. Though Turkey has several successful wineries in other parts of the country, this is the first here in modern times. In the field, the workers are practicing Muslims who don't drink a drop, but say they're grateful for the jobs. Uskan believes his company is successful because the winery and its wines are a microcosm of Turkey's diversity. Tradition and innovation working in tandem. Modern Turkey at its best. 
But there are new pressures, new rules to contend with, and they're hard to explain, Özkan says, to European colleagues. They can't understand tastings are forbidden or promotion is forbidden, fairs are forbidden, trade shows are forbidden. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they can't imagine how to survive in this uh, business. Özkan chose to build his business in one of the country's most conservative towns, a place known best for its holy tombs, worshipped by different Muslim denominations. But since he planted his first vines nearly 20 years ago, a more conservative wave has swept the country. <laughs> Recep Tayyip Erdogan promised to be a voice for rural Turks and pious Turks in particular who felt pushed to the margins of secular society. He himself was jailed for reciting a religious poem when he was mayor of Istanbul in 1997. His movement promised to build a new, more inclusive Turkey. Under Erdogan and his AK Party's rule for the last 15 years across Turkey, piety has become increasingly political. And that is stoking already deep fears that Turkey's long tradition of separating mosque and state is decaying. This grand space, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, is a vivid and popular example of Turkey's past and present. It was a Byzantine church, an Ottoman mosque, and is now a Turkish museum. Some of the president's supporters would like to see it become a mosque once again. To dismiss the secularism religious debate as simply a Turkish problem could be a dangerous mistake. Some feel secularism is not a rejection of religion, but instead a way to inoculate Turkey against the sectarian divisions, the wars at its borders. And they're concerned that what was once a safe, secular democracy, a Western ally for decades, could be drifting away. Parents in Elmalı and across Turkey, education might just be the biggest battleground. There is deep worry in Turkey that parents in villages and cities are losing their choice and control over what their children are learning. State-funded religious schools like this one in Elmalı are going up and in many cases replacing existing public secular schools. But even at those secular schools, one of the first things elementary schoolers will see is that red banner, a tribute to a soldier killed during last year's coup attempt. Martyrdom is a concept they'll soon become familiar with. <laughs> Protests to protect secular education are now being held regularly in cities including Istanbul. Not everyone is willing to listen. These women say they are the ones discriminated against in Turkey. The man on the phone is threatening to call the police. He doesn't believe the group has a right to raise its concerns. Anger is routinely overtaking tolerance. When she's not at those protests challenging the government's decisions, Maltan Figen is a working mom, also raising her eight-year-old son alone. She says she's hearing about changes to the curriculum on a weekly basis. News that evolution theory is being pulled from lesson plans has become one of the biggest worries. Teorilerde bilimselliğin e, doğu, doğduğu yerdir. Bir, iki, üç, dört. Hangisi? Reading, writing, arithmetic and sciences are still, of course, part of the curriculum, but Figen is worried the government is trying to engineer a new population. Geleneksel bir toplum yapısı oluşturmaya çalışıyorlar. İslami değerlere uygun geleneksel bir toplum yapısı oluşturmaya çalışıyorlar. Mustafa Kemal's fantastic dream is creating a democratic Turkey. The diverse Turkish people have lived through sharp shifts before. Its secular system came into effect in 1923, the year it became a republic. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the general who became the architect of that new Turkish state, made radical changes to modernize his country and quickly. Western clothing and hats replaced the fez and religious clothing. 
Mustafa himself takes charge of replacing the difficult Arabic script. Turkey's language changed too, from Ottoman Turkish using Arabic script to Turkish written in the Roman alphabet. To make a modern nation, all Turkey must be sent to school. For some, what Atatürk did during a time of war in a volatile region with competing religious sects had to be done. Berin Sönmez doesn't see it that way, at least not entirely. Atatürk'ün en büyük başarısı bunu başarıp bir bağımsızlık e, kazandırması bir ülkeye. Fakat kazandırdığı bağımsızlığın e, yönünü çizerken aşırı baskıcı, e, tepeden inmeci bir e, modernleşme dayatması ve bunun kısa sürede gerçekleşmesi de istemesi tabii kırılmalara yol açtı. Sönmez is a devout Muslim and a devout feminist. Türkiye'ye layıktır, layık kalacak. She was among the tens of thousands of women who felt the sting of secularism in the late 1990s. Forced from their jobs and classrooms because of their beliefs and their headscarves. They would make up a large part of Erdogan's base. And now a new generation enjoys new freedom and wealth they feel they owe to the president. Earlier this year, Erdogan secured a narrow victory to expand his powers. About half the country still believes in his promises. But the resentment sown in Turkey's past is still alive for many Muslims in Turkey, and it appears quickly on this stage back in the town of Elmalı, at a yearly gathering on issues in the Islamic world. This writer compares secularism to a bat used to beat religious Turks. The speeches are to remind people of their roots, the sense of their struggle through Turkey's past and present, as they try to preserve religious traditions in a connected modern world. Özgürlük bir kere kafanın içinde olan bir şey. Ve bu özgürlük sadece... Sönmez believes calling secularists out on their past mistakes is important. But she does not give the Erdogan government its authoritarian shift and crackdown on dissent a pass. To her, his government is a broken promise on a dangerous path. Başlarda ben yolaşist olmadığını düşünüyordum. Samimi bir itirafla. Kozmetik düzenlemeler yaptı, kozmetik iyileştirmeler yaptı. Will President Erdogan's grip get tighter? Will its founding father's dream of a secular democracy die? Will a Western ally become an enemy. These are fears that weigh on millions of Turks. But today, the town of Elmalı has its traditions and tolerance, not this side or that. And still, some semblance of us. For now. Need Kirksal, CBC News, Elmalı, Turkey. Coming up, voters in Nunavut choose new leadership to grapple with critical issues like the desperate need for a new long-term care facility. That's next on The National. You want a vacation? Never been to Italy. You want to go? No, no, never really think about what we even do. Maybe five day in Venice, copy in St. Mark's Square overnight in Siena, and drive down Amalfi Coast in Convertible. Mm. I feel like you think about it is. Mm. CBC Music presents the Canadian Music Class Challenge. Teachers, go to cbcmusic.ca slash music class and upload your students playing a selected song to enter. Nunavut heads to the polls tomorrow in the fifth general election since the territory was created in 1999. Across its constituencies, all 72 candidates are running as independents. There are no political parties at the territorial level. The CBC's Jane Sponagle takes a look at what to watch. Yeah, you're a little cutie, aren't you? Yeah. Adam Ariak Lightstone is a new face in Nunavut politics, and at 30, he's one of the youngest candidates in this election. I also do believe that it's going to be the next generation that's going to be required to take us the rest of the way. Ariak Lightstone is part of that new generation entering the political scene. Almost a quarter of candidates are 40 or younger. That's up from 8% in the last election, but another quarter of candidates are older than 60. The oldest, 78. 
Many of the same faces pop up in Nunavut politics again and again, some from before Nunavut was even a territory, like Jack Anawak. He helped establish Nunavut's first government in 1999. Now he wants to fulfill the vision of the leaders who fought to create the territory. I think their dream has been sidelined, and I think it's, it's time that Nunavut gets a strong, decisive leadership to, to put it back on track. The dream, Anawak says, of a territory where Inuit societal values would be the cornerstone of a government. But that seems far from the reality. Many Inuit live in inadequate housing, are unemployed, and do not have access to mental health care. And a growing concern, a shortage of elder care centers. Francis Caput is 87 years old and still healthy enough to live at home. But others have been forced to leave Nunavut for care. There are only 27 long-term care beds spread out over three communities and assisted living facilities in three other communities. That means some elders, who often don't speak English, are sent south, sometimes as far away as Ottawa. He says when elders don't want to leave, they won't use the word no because it's in their traditional ways to just listen to directions. It's heartbreaking to hear that they're being sent down south. Many issues are facing the next government, which will be elected tomorrow night. However, we won't know who the next premier is until Nunavut's consensus government meets. The 22 MLAs will vote here in a few weeks. Jane Sponagle, CBC News, Iqaluit. We'll be right back with another look at our top story. U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders is in Canada studying the health care system. A Texas NFL team protested the words of the team owner in dramatic fashion today. All but 10 Houston Texans took the knee during the American National Anthem before a game against Seattle today. That's about 40 players. It's in response to a remark made by team owner Bob McNair last week. In reference to the controversial protests, McNair reportedly said, we can't have the inmates running the prison. Before we go, a recap of our top story. Real change always happens from the bottom on up. A Toronto audience was feeling the burn today. Bernie Sanders spoke after touring some Canadian hospitals. He was here to get a closer look at Canadian health care. Sanders has long been an outspoken supporter of a single-payer system for the U.S. That is The National for this Sunday night. For more news anytime, go to cbcnews.ca. Heather Hiscox is here tomorrow and the rest of the week. I'm signing off for the relaunch of The National coming in just a week now, so watch for that. I'm Susan Ormiston. Thanks for joining us. Tonight.